Hey guys, welcome to my home once again. Today we're looking at Luke chapter 5 and 6 and I wanted to unpack uh, four kind of key things. The first one is geography. Sounds pretty boring but actually it's really helpful. Um, one of the things that really helps me when I'm reading the Bible is to imagine myself in that place. So I thought it'd be helpful to look at some of the names of places mentioned and to unpack a little bit of where they are in situation and kind of how kind of close together they are, just to help you understand a little bit more about actually what you're reading and the place in which it takes place. So geography is quite helpful to help us to get into where the story is set. So uh, the first story in uh, chapter five takes place in the Sea of Galilee on the shores near Capernaum. So um, Peter's boat would have been just kind of parked on this side and Jesus would have asked him to put out into the middle of uh, the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee then drains down into the Dead Sea and all of this strip of land is a few thousand, um, it's one of the lowest points on the earth and Jerusalem is up on a massive high hill. So when you hear about the story of um, the Good Samaritan on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, he's dropping a few thousand um, meters. So it's kind of a cliff face that he's walking down on a path. Then on this side, it then drains back into the Mediterranean Sea. So in our story, we hear about Judea and Jerusalem and the area from Jerusalem and Judea, they would come and they would walk around Samaria because they didn't like Samarians and um, the Samaritans there. Then um, Jesus was born um, in Bethlehem, which is uh, down here. He was then went into Egypt, came back, but went and settled in Nazareth. So a lot of what the stories that happen in Luke, they take place around the Sea of Galilee and sometimes down into Judea. But sometimes uh, there's a few stories where Jesus just walks straight through Samaria um, with the woman at the well. So, and up here you can see that we've got Tyre and Sidon, which in verse 17 is what's talked about. So they came from the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon and came down to Galilee and uh, Nazareth down here. So one of the things, um, other than just geography, um, which does sound a little bit boring, feels like school, but actually it really helps you to ground you in the place in which these stories were set. One of the things I love about this passage is that again and again, Luke tries to drive home that Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. This idea that um, the Sabbath doesn't belong to man, but actually um, it belongs to Jesus. And that when we take a rest day, it's not just for our benefit, it's for us to connect with Jesus. And he goes into um, the passage and um, a little bit of context behind this. Um, so the Pharisees at the time descended from the line of um, kind of the priests and um, teachers of the law that were put in by Ezra. When the um, Jews came back to um, Jerusalem after the exile, um, when they were exiled to Babylon and um, one of the things that uh, they put in place was this tradition of the elders and this was the idea that around the laws that Moses had uh, been given by God they put boundaries and these boundaries became legalistic they became it's snares for people um, the Pharisees themselves couldn't actually kind of do them they would say that they'd be doing them but behind the back would not and Jesus comes in to really challenge this, that actually to get back to what the commands that Moses gave, and those were um, to love your neighbour, to observe the Sabbath, not do not work on the Sabbath. And all the Pharisees at that point were putting in were, um, well, what does work look like? Okay, so work is this, this and this. To the point where they were saying actually that work is to um, if your donkey or sheep or livestock falls into a ditch, you can't pick them back up. Um, and Jesus comes in and challenges the Pharisees in this and says, actually, no, the Sabbath is for doing good. And on two occasions in chapter six, he heals somebody or um, references a time where David, the King David, was this person who um, they held in high esteem because he was King David 
He was um, a man after God's own heart. And yet, Jesus pulls out one of the times when um, David actually didn't observe the laws that they put in place. And so in this passage, you see that Jesus is pulling out those threads of things that kind of add to what's already been said. And sometimes ensnare us in guilt and shame. Actually, to crush grain in our hand isn't a bad thing because it's actually feeding us and it's doing good. Jesus healed on the Sabbath because it was good. It was good to heal on the Sabbath. So in these two chapters, Luke covers a lot of content on what actually happened within Jesus' life and within the life of his disciples as well. We see within these two chapters that he appoints um, the disciples that actually Jesus took a whole night to pray of who to pick for his 12. At that point he'd called a few people um, but then laid down and actually appointed them as apostles during these chapters. And I think it's really interesting how Jesus takes an entire night to pray to make a big decision. When I was reading this and um, prepping, that was something that really stood out to me. That actually, could I say that I'd prepped and uh, read and prayed for an entire night before I'd made a big decision in my life? And I, more often than not, probably said no. Really challenging. Another thing that we see in these two passages is that Jesus can read minds. How awesome is that? It's like Charles Xavier, like I'm going to do mind tricks on you. It's just awesome that actually on two occasions in these two chapters, um, he calls out and kind of goes to the Pharisees like, by the way guys, you better buck your ideas up because I can actually hear what you're thinking, not just what you're saying. And I'm sure they were giving him body language and all of that. But again, it harks back to this idea that Jesus was adamant and wanted to um, get away from this idea that there were boundaries around the rules that God had made. Actually, by living in relationship with God, um, and we see it within the kind of Beatitudes, blessed if you have. Um, and then uh, Matthew, they, it goes into a bit more detail with this. But one of the things that really I love and really I take away from these two chapters is that we can trust Jesus that actually in the same way that in chapter 5 Peter trusted Jesus when he said oh by the way Peter go out and uh, push out boat go and do some fishing and put your nets on the other side he did it because he trusted Jesus even though it went against some of the stuff that he'd known for his whole life he was a fisherman he knew that if you go fishing during the day, actually the fish will be further down and you can't reach them. Whereas if you go fishing at night, they're more likely to be out and about. There's another thing that also really stands out and it's mentioned a couple times and a couple times later that Luke's trying to really draw the attention of the reader to is that um, Jesus often uh, withdrew to lonely places. This is the idea that actually the way that Jesus lived his life was to retreat and go and spend time with God and to um, spend time with his heavenly father. I find that challenging because I don't know about you but I, I struggle to sometimes just take some time out and go and not do anything but be with God. So in these passages Jesus tells two parables. Parables are just stories that um, convey a deeper meaning and have a kind of a moral takeaway. And one of the things uh, is the story of the wise and foolish builders, one who builds his house on sand and the other who builds um, his house on firm rock foundations. And the kind of takeaway is that actually when we live in our lives that we should build our life on Jesus who is our rock and foundation. That actually when the storms of life come, um, the, these are going to be the things that we kind of cling to. We're going to hold to Jesus' truth and um, to the promises that he gives, that actually there is a hope at the end of it all. The other story is of the two builders, one with a speck in his eye and one with a plank in his eye. Um, and I always imagine kind of, what would, it look, what would it be like to have that actually play out in real life? Ah, ah, got something in my eye. Ah. Yo, dude, 
What's up? Ah, uh, what? What's the matter? You got a speck in your eye? Why? How are you gonna help me? You've got a plank in your eye. Yeah. So? Ah. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Now you can help me. Oh, it'd be really weird and really stupid. The other thing that um, this kind of talks about is that actually when we're with each other and kind of working with each other, this story talks about how actually sometimes we can be looking at the fine details that are in other people's character and being really critical of them, but actually not looking at our own hearts and our own minds and realizing that actually we might have a plank in our eye. It's a bit of a, a brutal story, but I think it's really important for how we live our lives and following the way that Jesus has set. So my challenge to you guys is, um, what of those four things really stood out to you? Was it um, that actually when you're reading your Bible, you wanna um, go into a bit more of the depth of what, what does it actually mean to live in that place? Was it um, that actually you wanna look um, with your family um, at what it looks like to have Sabbath. Maybe it's that actually um, out of this passage you've been really challenged by who Jesus was and want to go into a little bit more depth with that. Maybe it's that actually you want to go through and read all the parables in uh, Luke and just um, unpack a bit more of the deeper meaning of them. So I hope this video has been helpful. Um, I hope that you've kind of gained something, uh, a bit more of knowledge of the way that Jesus lived his life and actually the way that he encouraged us to live. So, be good to one another, keep connected, and we'll see you on the other side. Bye. So my practical tip for this week is um, to download the Bible in One Year app. Um, it's a brilliant app um, and it allows you to get into the Bible. It, um, allows you to read the whole Bible within a year. They have um, a small bit of commentary for each passage of the old, um, the new, and either a psalm or a proverb. Um, and it's a really good way to just have a little morning devotional. I've been using it um, ever since we started in lockdown. Um, and it's just been really helpful for me to just start my day right, um, to do kind of half an hour of listening to the Bible um, and kind of reading along. Um, it's a really good app. Um, I recommend you check it out. See you soon. Bye.